Friends, everything about Jesus was astounding. It was marvelous. It was humanly unexplainable. So it's no wonder that when people marveled at him, but would not accept him, Jesus himself would marvel at their unbelief. How can people witness God's power over and over and over again? They admit that it's marvelous. They admit that it's divine. Yet they refuse to accept the one who does such wonderful things. Jesus himself explained that some people run from the truth because it exposes their sin, which they don't want to give up. The Apostle John tells us in his third chapter, and this is the judgment, the light has come into the world, and the people love the darkness rather than the light because their works were evil. For everyone who does wicked things hates the light and does not come into the light, lest his work should be exposed. Others were attracted to Jesus' charisma and his power. They marvel at the wonderful things he says and does, but they took nothing to heart. They follow Jesus from a distance. They want to be thrilled, but not changed. They want to be entertained, yes, but not saved. Often, they're willing to be identified as a follower of Jesus Christ, but their commitment is superficial, and it has no staying power. So as we get into the text of today in Matthew chapter 8, Matthew shows us two things that keep people from such genuine conversion. It's their personal comforts and their personal riches. Matthew 18. Now when Jesus saw a crowd around him, he gave orders to go to the other side. And so what's he talking about? So we just had Jesus in chapters 5, 6, and 7 preaching on the Sermon on the Mount. And so Jesus has come down from the mountain. He and his disciples were on the western shore of the Sea of Galilee. And the crowd had become so massive that he had to depart and go to the other side. So friends, Jesus was completely God. But he was also completely human. Just like you and I need rest on occasion, Jesus also needed an occasional rest and respite from the never-ending demands of those who came to him for help. When Jesus decided to cross the lake, the issue of commitment was pressed for several men who apparently were reevaluating their relationship with him. From Mark, we learn that some of the crowd got into boats to go to the other side of the lake and cross it with Jesus. But three men, a third's actually mentioned in Luke 9, obviously did not want to leave, and they approached Jesus just before he departed. Verse 19, And a scribe came up and said to him, Teacher, I will follow you wherever you go. So the first man was a certain scribe, and he's declaring his allegiance to Jesus. He's saying, Teacher, I'm going to follow you wherever you go, Jesus. I want to be there. And so since he didn't ask Jesus for a question or a favor, we can only guess at the man's motive for making that statement to him. As a scribe, he would have broken with the majority of his fellow scribes had he become a dedicated disciple of Jesus Christ. He knew such a decision would be costly, and perhaps he wanted to see how Jesus reacted to that declaration of allegiance to him. And the question is, who were scribes? Were they just people that wrote down stuff on paper? No. The scribes were authorities in Jewish law, and they were closely associated with Pharisees. They were highly educated, and they were of the scholarly class of Jewish society. They were a big deal. They were fiercely loyal to the system of religious traditions that many of their forerunners had been instrumental in devising. Typically, scribes were teachers. They were not followers of teachers. And they were especially reluctant to follow a teacher such as Christ, who not only was not educated in the rabbionic school, but actually denounced the traditions that they held sacrosanct. For a scribe to address Jesus as teacher was therefore a considerable concession in and of itself. No doubt the crowd around, even probably the inner circle of the twelve, were impressed that the Lord was spoken to so favorably by one of the Jewish leaders. And so in his own mind, the man no doubt believed that what he said about Jesus was true. Just as Peter no, was uh, later convinced in his own mind that he would never forsake Jesus. We read in Matthew 26, Peter answered him, Though they all fall away because of you, 
I will never fall away. And Jesus said to him, Truly, I say to you, this very night, before the rooster crows, you will deny me three times. So neither man knew himself quite as well as he thought he did. The scribe may have sincerely thought that Jesus was the greatest teacher he had ever heard. Probably the greatest miracle worker he had ever seen. Remember, just before here, Jesus healed a leper. Jesus healed the centurion's servant. Jesus healed Peter's mother-in-law, as well as many others. He probably sincerely recognized Jesus' teaching and his power were from God, and that he was in some unique way maybe God's man for the hour. He found Jesus appealing and wanted to be associated with him. It says it right there in the text. He says, I'll follow you wherever you go. Jesus, where you are is where I want to be. Jesus, unlike many Christian churches today and many Christian organizations today, who are eager to embrace any famous personality that comes their way and makes a profession in his name, Jesus knows that a strong profession doesn't necessarily reflect a strong commitment. And so he responded to the scribe's statement, not with an answer, but by making a statement of his own. He didn't verbally question the man's sincerity, but he mentioned some of the demands of true discipleship maybe the man had never considered. Verse 20, And Jesus said to him, Foxes have holes, and birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. So at first glance, Jesus' words seem unrelated to the scribe's affirmations. He was saying in proverbial form that in spite of his divine authority, because remember, Jesus is God, despite of that, and his miracle-working power, self-indulgence was not in his plan. And he's saying he even had fewer physical comforts than many animals. Foxes have holes they can call their own. Birds of the air have nests to which they can even return to and rest. And as we read a little further, but it says, but the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. And so the Messiah is first referred to as the Son of Man in Daniel chapter 7, verse 13. I saw in the night visions, and behold, with the clouds of heaven, there came one like a Son of Man, and he came to the Ancient of Days. And was presented before him, and to him was given dominion and glory and a kingdom that all peoples, nations, and languages should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion which shall not pass away, his kingdom one that shall not be destroyed. So Jesus is called by that title, the Son of Man, over 80 times in the Gospels, and it was the most common name that he used for himself. The scriptures go on to say that he has nowhere to lay his head. Jesus has no place of his own, no house, no property, not even a tent. You know, he didn't even have what we would consider the most basic comforts of life. We're told of him often spending times in the home of Peter and Capernaum, of Mary, Martha and Lazarus and Bethany. We're even told of Jesus spending nights under the stars in prayer but we're never told of him spending even one hour in his own house because he had none. And so his purpose in making such a statement was obviously to make the scribe take stock of the genuineness of his commitment. So, friends, impressive words of affirmation are easy to make, especially when one does not know the cost and the commitment involved. The Lord knows this, and he knew that the initial declared faith of many of his followers was shallow, and it was superficial. John, the Apostle John says, Now when he was in Jerusalem at the Passover feast, many believed in his name when they saw the signs that he was doing. And so Jesus is performing miracle and miracle and miracle and miracle. And everybody's saying, man, that, that guy is awesome. Of course we believe in him. Look at all the cool magic tricks he has. Look at the miracles he performs. Yet John goes on to say in the very next verse, But Jesus on his part did not entrust himself to them because he knew all people and needed no one to bear witness about him, for he himself knew what was in man. So the Lord had no faith in their faith because he knew it was not genuine. Those people were only committed to the wonder and the excitement that accompanied his work, not to him as Lord 
or to the work of the gospel itself. Jesus repeatedly refused to take advantage of temporary popularity, which he knew would soon turn into permanent rejection. In the parable of the sower, Jesus gives a vivid example of such people. Matthew 13, other seeds fell on rocky ground where they did not have much soil, and immediately they sprang up. Since they had no depth of soil, but when the sun rose, they were scorched. And since they had no roots, they withered away. A couple of verses later, it said, As for what was sown on the rocky ground, this is the one who hears the word and immediately receives it with joy. Yet he has no root in himself, but endures for a while. And when tribulation or persecution arises on the account of the word, immediately he falls away. Jesus knew human nature is fickle. It's unstable. We're a self-centered people by nature. And many people are attracted to him by the excitement or the glamour or the hope of some kind of personal benefit, such as being fed or healed. They're quick to jump on the bandwagon when things are going well. But as soon as the cause becomes unpopular or demands sacrifice, they're quick to jump off too. At first, they look like they're alive for Christ, and they often give these glowing testimonies, but when their association with him becomes to uh, cost more than they bargained for, they lose interest and are never seen again in the church or in any type of Christian work. The Bible commentator R.C.H. Linsky observes that such a person sees the soldiers on parade, the fine uniforms, the glittering arms, and are eager to join forgetting the exhausting marches, the bloody battles, the graves, perhaps unmarked. And so Jesus knew the scribe was too eager to declare his allegiance. He did not count the cost of discipleship, which involves self-denial. It involves sacrifice, quite possibly suffering. Jesus' proverb about foxes and birds represented a relatively minimal sacrifice of being homeless. Yet even that cost was obviously too high because the scribe simply disappears without another word by or about him in all of text in the gospel. The Lord's words hit him where he was weak and unwilling, and his true loyalty was only to his own comfort and was quick to show itself. Friends, pay attention to this because this is really, really important. Sugarcoating the message of the gospel, trying to make it appear less demanding than it is, or even not demanding at all, it not only compromises God's words and does disservice to the Lord, but it also does disservice to the person whom we're witness to. Amen. And Jesus never, ever, ever, ever did such a thing. Right? Matthew 10, Jesus, Behold, I am sending you out as sheep in the midst of wolves, so be as wise as serpents and as innocent as doves. Jesus tells us, if you want to follow me, I'm going to send you out in the midst of the wolves. That is where you're going to go, and it's not going to be a fun place to be sometimes. He goes on further to say, Brother will deliver brother over to death, and father his child, and children will rise against parents and have them put to death, and you will be hated. Did it say you may be hated? It says you will be hated by all for my name's sake, but the one in, who endures to the end will be saved. Jesus doesn't sugarcoat the message of the gospel. Toward the end of his ministry, the Lord said to his disciples, and remember, his disciples are the 12 people that he was the closest to the entire time he was here on earth. Some of those he would consider his very best friends. And it says in John 16, verse 2, they will put you out of the synagogues, talking to him. Indeed, the hour is coming that when... Not if, because we know the disciples were, were murdered, okay? That when whoever kills you will think he is offering service to God. That hour is coming. Paul assures us when he's writing his letter to his beloved Timothy, second letter. Indeed, all who desire to live a godly life in Jesus Christ will be persecuted at some time or another. Okay? After presenting the long list of faithful Old Testament saints, the writer of Hebrews says to them that some were tortured, 
refusing to accept release so they might rise again to a better life. Others suffered mocking and flogging and even chains and imprisonment. They were stoned. They were sawn in two. They were killed with the sword. They went about in skins of sheep and goats, destitute, afflicted, mistreated, of whom the world was not worthy, wandering about in deserts and mountains and in dens and in caves on the earth. Friends, a scribe who came to Jesus on the shore of Galilee was not willing to pay any such uh, cost and price for his faith. He merely wanted to add some excitement to his life. Right? Having the prestige of being identified with a popular leader or some equally self-centered objective. And as we know, brothers and sisters, for those that follow Christ, we know that there's no thrill or joy like knowing and following Jesus Christ. But it's not a thrill that the world can understand or even appreciate. Jesus gives great peace to those who belong to him, but it's not the kind of peace that the world gives or seeks. The Apostle John in 14, it says, Peace I leave with you. My peace I give to you. Not as the world gives do I give to you, Lest not your heart be troubled, neither let them be afraid. And so the Christian life is not adding Jesus to my way of life, right? To one's own way of life, but renouncing that way of life, doing a complete spin around and say, no, I'm not going to walk that way anymore. Jesus, I'm going to start walking towards you and being willing to pay whatever cost that may require. Whatever that cost is. He goes on to say in verse 21 here, Another of the disciples said to him, Lord, let me first go and bury my father. And so this man, like the scribe in verse 19, was one of Jesus' disciples in the sense of being a follower who was unofficially identified with him. For those of us that are walking through the holiness of God on Wednesday night, the video, it just gave a great example. It said when Jesus just walked about, he taught as he was walking. So he would just be walking, he would talk, and the people that were following were the disciples. Those included the twelve, but you had other people that would kind of come in and out of the mix also. You had some that were the Pharisees were sent out to kind of spy on Jesus and report back to them what was being said. And so this disciple here wasn't one of the twelve, but perhaps followed Jesus about on the countryside maybe a few weeks, possibly a few months. And like the scribe, he assumed that his relationship with Jesus is all that it should be. And he made what seems to be a pretty reasonable request. And so since the Jews didn't practice embalming, a dead body had to be prepared and buried quickly. And not only that, but Jewish tradition required that a person, a person mourn for his deceased mother and father for at least 30 days. And so Jesus went to the, go to the other side of the Sea of Galilee. Obviously, a burial could not wait for his return. But that's not what the man's asking. The man's asking for permission to bury his father, however, did not mean that the father was already dead. It was a common Near Eastern figure of speech that referred to a son's responsibility to help the father in the family business until the father died and the inheritance was distributed. And so obviously such a commitment can involve a long period of time. It could be 30 or 40 years if the father was relatively young. And so since a man's inheritance was customarily lost or reduced if he didn't fulfill his expected responsibilities to the family, the phrase, I must bury my father, was frequently equivalent to, I want to wait until I receive my inheritance. Right. So the second superficial disciple did not want to risk losing his inheritance by committing himself fully to Jesus. He wanted to be associated with Jesus in name, yes, but the focus of his life was on his personal prosperity and well-being, not of service to the Lord. So Jesus goes on to say in verse 22, And Jesus said to him, Follow me and lead the dead to bury their own dead. So what is he talking like? It's like foxes have holes and birds of the air have nests. The seemingly nonsensical expression to allow dead people to bury their own dead was another proverbial figure of speech. It meant let the world take care of the things of the world. The spiritually dead can take care of their own things. Luke adds further instruction and context in Luke 960. Same story. And Jesus said to him, leave the dead to bury their own dead. But as for you... Go and proclaim the kingdom of God. 
And so the man's primary responsibility as a disciple of Jesus Christ would be to proclaim the gospel. That's what we're called to do, friends. We're called to proclaim the good news of eternal life to the spiritually dead. The Christian's responsibility is not to follow and mimic the world, but to be a witness to the world in Christ's name and his power. His citizenship is not as in the living eternal kingdom of God, not the dead and decaying realm of this world. So again, like the scribe, the second of the disciples who approach Jesus on this occasion also disappears without further mention. How sad. Apparently neither man wanted to discuss the matter further with him. Jesus' demands were too high, and the appeal of discipleship just vanished. So for Jesus to say, follow me, is like he said in Matthew 16, 24. It's for him to say, he said to his disciples, if anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. It's not that any amount of self-denial can, or sacrifice can earn salvation, because it can't. It can't. But anything that's held more dearly than Christ is a barrier to Christ and will stand between the unsaved person and salvation. Nothing can be in between you and Jesus Christ if you're going to proclaim yourself to be a follower of him. Luke tells us of a third man that came in this same situation to Jesus on this occasion to make a profession of discipleship. It was Luke 9, 61. Yet another said, I will follow you, Lord. But let me first go say farewell to those at my home. As with the two other men, the man's statement seems perfectly reasonable. It would take but a few days, maybe a few weeks at the most, for him to pay his parents a simple courtesy of saying goodbye. But Jesus knew the man's heart, and his motivation was weak, and his loyalty was divided. He was not yet ready to give himself wholeheartedly to Jesus Christ as Lord. He was still tied to his parents' apron strings and was under the dominance and their control. This is like super important. The decision to follow Jesus Christ is the most uniquely personal decision that can be made. Okay? Nobody can do it for you. Brother can't do it for brother. Parents can't do it for children. Children, as much as they wish they could, they can't do it for parents. It's wonderful when friends encourage someone to decide for Christ. And it's tragic when they advise against it. But whatever the outside influences may be, the commitment is the individual's alone to make. So Jesus replies in verse 62, Luke 9, said to him, No one who puts his hand to the plow and looks back is fit for the kingdom of God. So he makes it crystal clear that commitment to him is reserved, is unreserved, or it's not a commitment at all. Matthew chapter 10, verse 34. Do not think that I have come to bring peace to the earth. I have not come to bring peace, but a sword. For I have come to set man against his father, and daughter against her mother, and a daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law, and a person's enemies will be those in his own household. Whoever loves father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. Whoever loves a son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. And whoever does not take his cross and follow me is not worthy of me. If a person allows anything to hold him back from full allegiance to Jesus Christ, the, the text makes it clear, guys. It says he is not worthy for the kingdom of God. If there's anything that stands between you and Jesus Christ. And so Jesus... It's not talking about Christian service. He's talking about salvation. And God will save no one who comes to him with strings attached. And throughout the centuries, many people have marveled at Jesus, acclaiming his authority and his love and his wisdom and his purity and his power and his provision and his healing, even his deity. But they fail to give themselves fully to him. And they praise and profess Jesus, and then they just walk away. The Bishop J.C. Ryle wrote, The saddest road to hell is one that runs under the pulpit, past the Bible, 
and through the middle of warnings and invitations. Jesus' response to the three men who came to him on the shore of the Sea of Galilee seem to contradict his promise that he has in John 6. It says that all that the Father gives to me will come to me. And whoever comes to me, I will never cast out. And so those men personally came to Christ. They seem to come positively, speaking well of him, proclaiming their desire to follow him. But Jesus' words further down in John 6 explain why so many people who profess to come to Christ don't really come to him at all. He said in John 6, 54, just a couple of verses down, Whoever feeds on my flesh and drinks my blood will have eternal life, and I will raise him on that last day. So in other words, belief in Jesus is total identity with him. There's no such thing as a partial belief or partial salvation. We can't live in this world and also live in the eternal world of heaven at the same time. You can't do it. It's impossible. If you're even a little bit left in this world, you're completely in this world. A person who does not totally commit himself to Christ disbelieves in him. No matter how many positive things they have to say about him. Jesus therefore goes on to say in a couple of verses later, verse 64, But there are some of you who do not believe. For Jesus knew from the very beginning who those were who did not believe and who it was who would betray him. Verse 66, so sad. After this, many of his disciples, again, not the twelve, right? The people that were following him or said they were following him and they were followers of Christ. They turned back and no longer walked with him. And so coming to Jesus Christ, guys, is coming on his terms, not ours. The person who comes to Christ comes in humility. It comes in meekness. It's a needy beggar in spirit who hungers and thirsts for God's righteousness. It's one who cries for mercy. Someone who's willing to be hated. Who's willing to be reviled. Who's willing to be persecuted for the sake of the Lord. Guys, the Lord might not take away your personal comforts. He might not. Okay? He might not take away your money. Only one time in all of Scripture did he ask somebody to kind of give it all up, all their money, and, and follow him. Right? He might not take it away. He might not take away your relationships with others. But all those things and everything else must be given over to him to do as he pleases. Because otherwise, he's not Lord. Right? No matter how much allegiance to him is professed. Right? And so, brothers and sisters, you know, we can clearly see from the text of today, from God's very own words, I mean, Jesus takes our salvation very seriously. More seriously than we can ever, ever imagine. So seriously, in fact, that he was willing to die for you. Amen. And the sins that you commit, you committed in the past, the ones you commit in the future, so you can spend eternity with him. And eternity, remember, eternity doesn't start like one of these days once we get to heaven, right? We die and we go to heaven. Eternity starts at the moment of salvation. When the Holy Spirit rushes upon you and you claim to have God himself in the form of the Holy Spirit living inside of you, eternity has started. We start living for Jesus Christ in that very moment that we turn over our life to him or we haven't started at all. And if we have the Holy Spirit inside of us, that's God himself. We can't. It would be impossible for us to live the way that we used to live. It, it can't happen. Jesus loves you that much. And so the question for those of us that profess Jesus as our Lord is, are we like the scribe and the so-called disciples who like to be associated with Jesus it's kind of fun to name drop him, right? Take a selfie with him. I was hanging, look at this. This is kind of cool. I go to church on Sunday, right? I, I attend some Bible studies, right? We can tell our coworkers when we show up on Monday morning. It's kind of fun. But we never really fully commit ourselves to him. Or 
Are we once and for all finally going to turn away from that old worldly life that we had and live a life that's worthy to be called a follower of Christ? A worthy, life that's in honor of Jesus. But friends, there might be some of you here that is like, what are you talking about? Right? This is the first time I've ever even heard that Jesus is God. And it's the first time I've ever heard this. And what I want you to know is that God is holy and God is perfect. And it requires holiness and perfection from us. Holiness is his inability to sin. It means moral perfection. And it's something that God alone possesses. Holiness is an attribute of God's perfect nature. Therefore, since there is no one greater than God, and God is the greatest good, God is the standard of what is good. The law that he gave is a reflection of the character of God. The reason it's wrong to lie and to cheat and to steal and anything else you want to put in the blank is because God cannot do these things. He can't. Because he's holy and he's incapable of lying and cheating and stealing or anything else you want to put in there. God is perfect. Therefore, the law becomes our standard of righteousness, but we're incapable of keeping the law because I, you, are not holy. We're sinners. Friends, I'm a sinner, right? The only perfect person to ever walked this earth is Jesus Christ, and it's not me. I'm a sinner. We're all sinners. Right? And we have broken his law. The punishment for breaking his law is eternal damnation. Separation from God forever. And forever is forever. And so the gospel, why do we call it the good news? Right? The gospel is the good news that the judgment of God upon the person who's broken God's law can be removed in the person of Jesus Christ. That's the only way. And it's done because Jesus, who is God's son in flesh, was able to perfectly live the law and to offer himself as a sacrifice to the Father. His sacrifice was his death on the cross. Jesus died for us. Like, do, do we ever like really think about that? Like we say it and we like study a Bible, uh, do a Bible study about it every now and again. But Jesus didn't have to die for me. He's God. He could have done anything he wanted, right? He could have taken himself off the cross and, and kind of rolled on and did whatever the next thing was going to do. But he chose to stay there. And he chose to suffer. And he chose to die as a payment and a penalty for my sin. And so he's the only one. And so he died. He was there three days. He physically rose himself from the dead to prove that his words and his deeds and his sacrifice were true. Friends, therefore, if anyone wants to escape the righteousness of God's judgment, he must receive the sacrifice that Jesus made on the cross. It's done by faith alone. There's nothing we can do to work our way into heaven. We can't be good enough to get into heaven. We can't do enough good deeds to get into heaven. The only way to get into heaven is to fully commit ourselves to Jesus Christ. I'm a sinner. Lord, I need you. It's done by faith. Asking Jesus to forgive me of my sins and to fully commit myself to him. And as we see from the scribe and the disciple and the other disciple, it can't be a superficial faith. It can't be talking a good game because you might trick me and you might trick the person sitting next to you, but you can't trick Jesus, right? He knows us better than we know ourselves. He tells us in John 3, verse 16, For God so loved the world, he gave his only Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. And so as we close, you know, I'm going to be up here. I'm going to have a couple of our elders, Troy and Patrick, will come up. Friends, some of us 
are just going through a really hard time right now. Just the way it is. Life gets hard sometimes. And we know that it gets hard sometimes because it was hard for Jesus, right? It was hard for his closest followers. It was hard for his best friends. And if you want somebody to pray with you, man, come on up. We're happy to do it. We'd love to do it. Some, we have kneeling pads up here. Some just want to take their, their care and concern to the altar. Please do. Please do. Brothers and sisters, you know, for, for those of us that have professed Jesus as our Lord and Savior, and, and maybe we've kind of gotten off the tracks a little bit, and it, it happened. We can't look in the past. The past is gone. We can only look ahead in the future of what we're going to do today and tomorrow. Okay? If that's you, you know, and you want somebody to pray with you, we are here to do that. If you want to publicly commit saying, hey, I've gotten a little sidetracked, and I've, I've done, I haven't been as committed to Christ as he requires of me. Come on up. But friend, if you've never heard this before, and, and you're saying, man, I am a sinner. And, and Lord, he's just tugging on your heart right now, and he's saying, commit yourself to me. And friend, come up and, and let somebody know. Let somebody know. Because there's... That's, the heaven will be rejoicing at, at welcoming you into Christ. And so I, if you guys will pray with me. Father, thank you, Lord, for the day that we've had. And as we come into the time of worshiping you through song and invitation, Father, I just I pray that if there's anyone in here that you, you're calling them, just let him be a, a committed follower of you, Lord. That's any of us. We all need to be committed 100% to you or we're not committed at all. And so, Father, I just pray over this, this time together, this period of worship. And I pray it all in Jesus' name. Amen.